<laughs> I'm extremely excited to introduce Pam Chestic. Um, the first time we, I, I met Pam uh, was by phone and we talked for like an hour um, in a detailed trademark analysis where we had the same legal analysis and entirely different conclusions. Um, so she's a lawyer that I respect deeply and I'm very excited to introduce her to you. Well, thank you. And, and I'll... <laughs> And I'll say the, re the, reason, the reason we had um, the same legal analysis and dif different conclusions was she was working for a nonprofit and I was working for a commercial company and it strictly came down to how much risk are you willing to take. And representing a company that had a commercial interest and could be sued um, changed the analysis. So I thought I, I, it was a really interesting, it it, yeah, it was a great yeah. conversation just to, because it really helps you understand sort of what, you know, what the levers are in your decision making and, you, and it's never just a pure legal analysis. So anyway, um, to, and, and that company was Red Hat, um, which where I was a trademark lawyer for Red Hat for about four years. I've left Red Hat and uh, have my own practice now. I stayed in Raleigh, North Carolina, have my own practices. Um, basically, trademark lawyer, copyright lawyer, marketing, that kind of stuff. So, um, so what I wanted what I wanted to talk about today was that my, the title is why licenses requiring the use of trademarks are non-free, which is a really wordy way of saying. Um, badgeware licenses, but I didn't want to use the word badgeware because I think that has um, a suggestion of a particular d period of time and development. And actually, this is um, something that's hap that's still going on. So, as I said, I'm in I'm in North Carolina. Um, so this is this is my argument, which is a license that requires the use of a trademark for modified requires requires the use of a trademark for modified software impairs the right to modify the functionality and therefore is non-free. So I, I think that these licenses are fundamentally flawed. They are not free licenses. So just to kind of go into um, that little background, from a branding perspective, I think it's a really stupid idea and that's generally where I come from as a branding perspective. As a trademark lawyer, you know, I'm about the brand. If you if you take a if you took to any kind of um, traditional company and said, "Here, take my product, change it any way you not you want," and you can still call it that, <laughs> like they'd look at you, be, you and it, well, right on top of it, you must still not only can you, but you must still call it that. They would look at you like you're crazy. So, if, from a branding perspective, it's just an insane thing. But I'm not here to talk about it from a branding perspective. I'm here to talk about it from um, whether or not it's free software altogether. So. Um, just to kind of give you a little background, the original badgeware licenses, um, these, and, and I'm talking here about, this is an approved license, FSF lists this as a free software license. The standard is you must retain and reproduce any and all copyright patent trademark notices. This includes trademarks or logos. So this was, um, you know, people who are more familiar with the history than I am, uh, you know, this was controversial at the time. There was a lot of sort of hubbub about whether or not these are free licenses for various reasons. One of the reasons given was um, because a lot of times these licenses had very specific sort of descriptions of the graphical display that you were supposed to have and had to be a certain number of pixels and questions were, well, that militates that I have to have a graphical interface and if I don't have that, then what, you know, and so, um, so these licenses have tried to address those other problems that arose, but, but as far as I'm concerned, that hasn't solved the fundamental problem. So this is one, the Zimmer Public License, now version 1.4. Uh, FSF said version 1.3 was a free license. But they haven't said 1.4 is? I, I couldn't find it on the list. I just assume it was a matter of administrative bookkeeping that either nobody asked or just wasn't updated. So I didn't consider it to be um, a disagreement with one. This language is in both. It's the same language in both. Um, but it's but uh, 1.4. Then, uh, so then we have the Common Public Attribution License, which was this effort to solve this badgeware problem, was to come up with this license. Um, this was approved both by the OSI and, as, and is listed by the Free Software Foundation as a free software license. Again, a requirement for a prominent display of the original developer's attribution information, as defined below, must occur. And then this is, this is the, 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 nib of the, the nub of the problem. Um, the attribution information, the part that I've cut out, does include, you know, name of the author or some other stuff, but one of the lines is, graphic image as provided in the covered code, if any, i.e. a logo. Um, so this again, approved, approved license. So these are all several years old, but it's still coming up. Um, just, you know, a few weeks ago, 
on the OSI list, OSI license list. There was uh, so there was discussion of the Bean Books public license, where again this um, this badgeware provision appeared. This license had other problems that I think that got it rejected, but. Yeah, it was never actually it submitted, and Fontana and I convinced them to stop calling it an open source license. We had a call with them. So. Good work, but anyway, but 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 point point being point being that this is still and and um uh, I had a conversation uh, with Mateus yesterday at lunch, and I have personal experience. Um, the desire to have this is still runs very deep. People want this in their licenses, so even though it may feel like it's old news, it's not. It's still happening, so it's still being requested. Um, FSF accommodation, and, and I leave. I, I will stand corrected for those who know better than me, who, who feel that I, if I feel I've misrepresenting anything I've said here. So under the GPL v3, uh, again, as part of the sort of this, how do we co accommodate this? GPL v3, as Richard mentioned in his last talk, um, the additional terms provision in GPL v3 has uh, you can supplement the terms of this license requiring preservation of specified reasonable um, legal notices or author attributions or um, capital A, capital O, capital uh, and appropriate legal notices which are defined as copyright notice, no war uh, statement that there's no warranty, um, licensees may convey a work under this license and how to view a copy of the license. So let me just um, go back and point out two things here what I kind of call that here, um, they're, they're characterizing this as attribution information. And, that, and that's the term that's also used um, in the GPL v3, right, is author attribution. That's a very important, very important concept um, that, I wanted to, that I wanted to highlight. It, we'll get to that in just a second. So, so what it's come to, um, so GPL v3 had this, this, these additional, what is it, additional terms? Is that what it's called, additional terms? Um, there's there's a um, there's a provider I don't know NOP Commerce N O P Commerce I don't know who who if you go to their website they say that their product is licensed under um, GPL v3 with these additional terms the additional terms are all derivative works and copies of derivative works of the covered code and executable and source code form must include on each user interface screen the powered by NOP Commerce text must be visible, must appear in each screen, and must be in the same position in each case. So that's a pretty, uh, uh, Richard, I, I know that Richard's personal feeling is that is so far beyond what was intended was by, these, by these additional terms. But nevertheless, the, uh, the GPF v3 kind of opened the door on it. Um, well, and, and I, I will say, I don't think this is an open source license. I think it's deceptive to the extent they claim it is. I don't think it's GPL v3 at all. And which I think is really exemplified in this next slide because then if you go to their, if you go to their web page, and this I discovered when I was doing this, this slice, have you seen this Richard? No. Oh my God. <laughs> so we have the Knopf Commerce copyright removal key. Would you like to remove the powered by Knopf Commerce link in the bottom of the, in the bottom of the footer? Uh, so if, if you don't mind, if you bear with me, I'll read the whole thing because it's such tiny letters. According to the terms of the Knopf Commerce license, you may not, capital N-O-T, remove or hide the powered by Knopf Commerce statement that appears at the bottom of each page. It gets better. If you have not purchased a valid copyright notice removal license for Knopf Commerce, <laughs> the copyright notice at the foot or, uh, at the foot of your store at the in the at the footer of your store must remain intact, unedited, and clearly visible. Please don't attempt to edit, remove, or hide the copyright notice in any way. It does not give you authorization to remove any copyright notice in the script source files nor any other rights. Copyright is illegal. Copyright infringement is illegal. Please be <laughs> advised. Calling well, calling that a copyright notice. Is <laughs> well, and so right. Thank you, thank you. Because that was one of my points. What do we have here? This is a this. Is, Powered by Knopf Commerce, that is not a copyright notice. So they're characterizing this as a copyright notice. It's a complete fabrication. There's nothing about it that's a copyright notice, right? That is a trademark, if anything, <laughs> not a copyright. And it's not even... I mean, there are actual legal definitions of what constitutes a valid copyright notice, right? And we're, we'll get to that in the slide or two. Yeah, <laughs> we're getting to that. So, uh, yeah, so, th so this was kind of like, you know, once you open the door an inch, you know, people push it open a mile wide. So, so we can, 
So we can sit here and laugh at it, and I think we would all agree that there is nothing, there is nothing um, free about what they're trying to do here, but nevertheless, they, they kind of took the GPLv3 and leveraged it. Um, but this was, you know, clear, clear sign of their intention, right? This is not, anyway, <laughs> I could go on about it. So, um, so how did we get here? Um, this, is, this is kind of my theory, is that, that there's, and, and Richard, poor Richard, I'm sorry. Um, but it's in writing, so I, I, I felt like it was appropriate to cite it. Um, it's, it's a false premise to, to say that a trademark is an attribution, and that was kind of the sales pitch. And this is, this is from oh, Richard's yes. mouth. It says, I recall that RMS was convinced that an indicator of origin logo was logically equivalent to an author attribution, um, and the FSF was convinced that powered by corporate logo could itself be a reasonable author attribution. So that was that was kind of how we got. And I don't know, Richard, if just you want to share. Little, little Lucky I didn't see those posts, Richard. <laughs> With a little history, um, yeah, it, it was do. the famous Silicon Valley lawyer Mark Radcliffe who convinced uh, the FSF lawyers that this was. You know, he had a lot of good, well, what we thought were good arguments. He was also representing companies. So he convinced that, you. That, that That's what you're saying. So when are you passing the buck if someone's not in the room? <laughs> but that was part of the <laughs> conversation. Why do you that, have that? What you wrote there is not eyes. the conclusion. <laughs> the conclusion is what the text of the GPL says, which is not that. It, it, well, that's. Oh, I think that's right. a very yeah. right. That's, that's a very good point. That's why you're misquoting our mess there. And, and we sure. will. Um, we're, we're, I will get to that too. Yeah. That there is a disconnect here between yeah. what is being said here and what the GPL ended well, we just, up saying. No, was no, 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 no. This is what our mess said. Yeah. Um, and was there, and I just, and I couldn't find it, but you also just fairly recently, you fairly recently said an email where, was it the Sugar CRM license? Who was it that actually was talking to FSF and Mark, kind of Mark, got his... Mark Radcliffe and um, what, what, was uh, Larry it Sugar, Augustine. Which license was it that, do you recall which license it was? Was it Sugar CRM or... Yeah, so they originally had their own badware license and then when GPLv3 came out, they had negotiated with the FSF to allow that, that kind of limited attribution stuff in. And so they, they were the first actual commercial software to um, to use GPLv3, they, and they now use AGPLv3. So, so let, actually, uh, so Bradley raised a good point, which is you know the language that's in the GPLv3 that I showed you on an earlier slide says nothing about logos. It says nothing about. It says it says specifically legal notices and author attributions. Yeah, right? The reason I'm getting so upset is because the recording here from Richard is is recollection of a negotiation that he's retelling. And it's not necessarily what the final conclusion was. That's that's the issue. The final conclusion is what's in the license. That's, so, yeah. That's no, 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 it's what, not what, technically what? incorrect because it says it's the logically logical equivalent. Right. That doesn't mean it's the legal equivalent. Right. Yeah. Right. No, 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 so, right. So, so the FSF <laughs> the FSF approved of Sugar CRM's use of GPLv3, which included it wasn't as extreme as some of those the later examples of the Zimbra license or whatever mm -hmm. it was, um, but it, it was Sugar CRM. Um, Said that you had to put you you know you had to powered not by remove sugar power by sugar CRM. Yeah. So so the FSF was convinced that sugar power by sugar CRM was a legitimate form of author attribution for purposes of that. Yeah, case. and that's again. Th so that's the point is that that's why I was asking about uh, trying to recall whether it's sugar CRM because sugar CRM essentially got a blessing that it was okay for them based on GPLv3 that it was okay for them to use this powered by sugar CRM and and, but, and I would just add that that later on they they took it further and further, and the FSF, I don't think, monitored what they were doing, and I don't think the FSF would approve of what they were yeah, doing today. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. so... Speaking as, direct, speaking as the director of the FSF, that's absolutely... The last statement is absolutely... So, so I think, and, and again, you know, uh, what I what I feel, I feel is important here is to understand the political pressures that we're playing here was this, there was this, there was this desire to have the ability to force you to, force you to, force identification of where this stuff came from. It's an understandable desire, and so there were political pressures, and that's, that's kind of what came into play and what happened. So that's how we got here, was this sort of, but, but my, you know, but, but they didn't have the value of this trademark lawyer standing in front of you today to who would have said to you was is attribution is not equal to trademark they are not the same thing um, so we'll look at a couple definitions attribution this is out of a law dictionary so, uh, if you go to a regular dictionary it's fairly close uh, basically it's the right to be credited as an author to have your name either attribute either with the work or uh, 
uh, use one's name and connection, or, or to forbid the use of a name and connection with a work one did not create. Is that person as in legal person, therefore could be company, or is it person as in natural person? Gosh, you just got like so ahead of me. <laughs> no, uh, and, and I'm glad you asked that question, and maybe you can help me answer that question. So, uh, what, but, and, and I will get to that second. The first point I want to make so I don't lose track was, um, again, author, author. the attribution right is for the author, which is not necessarily the copyright owner. So again, just to break it out a little more, mm -hmm. you know, if you work for a corporation, you may be the author, you wrote the code, but your corporation is the, in the U.S., your corporation, your employer is the copyright owner. So your employer's name would go in the um, copyright notice, but you were the author, and, you, and, and so to the extent there's attribution, it is you personally who had that. I, I was on Wikipedia this morning looking to see what, I, I don't believe corporations as a general rule have a right of attribution. So the attribution is one of, um, is a moral right, which is kind of a third category or a, a, an additional category of trademark, we have copyright, and then moral rights are kind of a separate, separate and apart from copyright, more or less robust in different, com in different companies, not at all robust in the United States, very robust in France. Which brings me to, I'm not sure, I tried to figure out this morning, like in the United States, absolutely not. There would be no moral right, because we barely recognize moral rights at all. So in the United States, absolutely no moral rights for a corporation. I don't know about other countries. I don't know whether you've run into countries where they have, where companies themselves have, have attribution rights. Anybody have uh, opinions? Oh, good. <laughs> Just thinking about it from a logical perspective, which is not always the legal way yes. to do it, but um, if, if a person has a right to be credited as a works author, that accrues to them as goodwill and personal reputation. Yes. Um, one would have thought there was a reasonable argument that that can only accrue to. Well, and I, and I and I think that that's the reasonable argument that worked with you know with FSF. FSF. But but let me get to my next slide. So so attribution. You know, to be credited uh, with, as your as an author as attribution. Sorry, can I just one remark from European point of view? Yes, please. But in European attribution right, in European continental law, I think it's uh, droit moral, mm -hmm. really personal right, and to, you can refuse it. It's Correct, but the question is, yeah, the question is. Uh, oh yeah. Um, so the point was in the in European law, the droit mor moral. Forgive my my pronunciation. Um, is one that you cannot um, rid yourself of. Uh, in some countries you can waive it, agree not to enforce it, but, but it's personal and attaches to you personally. So I, again, I'm not sure about the, the corporate, yeah. Um, also to your point about authorship, uh, uh, it's reasonably well recommended that we can't hire people who are not Yeah. No, that's that's correct in terms of copyright ownership. Yeah, I'm saying that I'm sure. Um, the point was is that when you work for hire, your authorship it actually actually doesn't transfer. It is that the corporation is the owner of the copyright from the inception, not the individual. The but also. well, but what I'm I'm not sure that that's not true. I'm not sure that that's true of the moral rights, no, which is what I'm talking I'm about. Sorry, I'm yeah, and I'm that I'm really talking about attribution here as the moral right, the moral right of attribution. Um, so, so this is what we, the, the, the moral right of attribution, which is really what we're talking about here, is that you're the, you get credit for having created the work. Um, a trademark, these are the trademark functions, this is identified, um, this is U.S. law is identified, these are the roles of trademark. An indication of origin, and I put an asterisk here because origin is very clear under U.S. law. When we say origin, we're talking about the manufacturer, not the author. Um, origin does not mean authorship under U.S. law. Um, it's a guarantee of constancy of the quality. That's kind of one that we're all the, we all talk about that one as, as like we, we understand we understand both of those. Uh, medium of advertisement. This of course is what the company who wants the badge wear provision is after. That's what that's the role that they're looking for is this advertisement. Um, if you go to Europe, Europe has found even more functions of a trademark. Um, in addition, they have as a communicative communicative tool and as an investment. But nevertheless, if you look at these, these are very different from that moral right of attribution. These are very different from being credited as an author. There's no overlap here. So to say that, that, there's, that, that these are, I think that to make the case that these are similar overstates the case a great deal. They have very different functions. Trademark um, is 
to, you know, is, and I don't want, I hate to say guarantee of source because people think of it as a literal guarantee. It's not that. It's simply that you as a consumer can go to a sign and say, I know that sign, I recognize that sign, it has brand qualities to me that are meaningful, and therefore I can make a judgment based on it. That's what that, that's what that guarantee of, of constancy is. So, so these, to me, these are very different roles. Um, and so that's, so I want to kind of, you know, to me it was sort of a straw man to say that, oh, it's really just, you know, sort of a attribution for a company. It's really not that at all. Trademark is a very different, a very different um, role in society. Um, so con concluding, trademark guarantees identifies and sells the product or service to which it refers. Nothing to do with sort of I create, nothing to do with the act of creation or that I created this, which is what in open source we're looking at when we talk about attribution. We're talking about who created this. Um, so none of these related to the interest that attribution protects. <coughs> Whoops, wrong way. So, so let's, all right, so let's pull this forward now. Okay, great, we've identified what it is. Um, so what are the things, what are the restrictions that we see in um, free and open source software <laughs> licenses? Um, very commonly, attribution, the requirement that attribution remain. We're all okay with that. It's still an open source license, even though we have that restriction on it. Um, you can disclaim warranty, that's all, all okay. Re uh, convey a copy of the license, license derivative works under the same license. These are all understood to be um, sort of restrictions that exist, but nevertheless we're still okay with these being open source licenses. Um, but, but these are qualitatively different from a requirement that you retain the trademark. So the first two, so attribution, um, as we said, it's the right to have your name associated with the work. And in some countries, there is a cause of action if you remove that attribution. So to say you keep it on there is actually sort of ratifying what the law might say, which is you keep, you keep the authorship on there. Um, allowing the author to avoid liability by disclaiming warranty, well, you know, give the author a break. They, they just don't, you know, they wrote some free software. So that seems very fair and reasonable. So it's, it's, or it's, a, it's a way for the author to disclaim legal responsibility um, in a way that we, that we think is fair. Or the other ones are to protect the license scheme itself, to protect the ecosystem itself. Um, none of these are limits. It's a, none of these are limits in what way the code itself can be modified. None of these say, you know, you can't change APIs or you can't change functionalities. You can't add classes. Like none of them. None of these say that. None of these address the functionality. They're all sort of extrinsic to the code itself. With an asterisk, the GPL um, v3 and earlier versions of it, there is a requirement that legal notices have to be displayed. But the legal notices, remember, are still the attribution of the warranty, so they're kind of consistent with this. Um, so, so what? Um, so we'll go back to the kind of the GPL v3. What we we can retain legal notices. Um, a trademark is not by any stretch a legal notice, and this is what Jerv was alluding to. A legal notice in the context of a trademark would be, for example, registered in U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. <laughs> that's a legal notice. That actually, that's in the, that's in the statute. So to say, you know, powered by Knob Commerce or powered by Sugar Shiar, those are not legal notices. Do any lawyers disagree with me on that? That those are legal notices? No. Okay. Good. Um, second. Second. I think that's important here. It's not illegal to take off a trademark. There's no cause of action for taking a trademark off of a product and reselling that product. So you don't get in trouble for taking the trademark off. So as in the case of our attribution, where you might get in trouble if you remove that authorship, that's not happening. So we're not sort of restating a legal obligation by saying you have to leave the trademark on there. That's not, that's not what's going on here either. Um, so. But, and this is, the, this is the money shot here, um, so, so by, by saying that a trademark may be retained for modified software, you're forcing someone who is modifying that software to choose between two, two conditions or comply with both of them, 
they, if they modify the software, they're going to subvert the guarantee function of trademark. Remember we said that it's sort of this assurance of consistency, assurance of, of that what I got the last time is going to be the same thing I got this time. So if you modify the software but keep the same name on it, you have de you've deceived consumers. And fundamentally, well, that's what trademark law is supposed to be about, is not deceiving consumers. So you're p putting that author who wants to be... Um, a good and honest person in the position of keeping a trademark on something that they know is di very different from what the original source, what the original project was. And they either have to do that, they're either going to subvert that and sort of misrepresent what the software is because they've modified it, or they're going to breach the license if they take the, if they take the license off. So they, you, put them sell, you put them in um, a, a pickle where they're going to have to choose one wrong or the other. I'm either going to subvert trademark law, the intent of trademark law, um, or I'm going to breach my license. And the other option would be to try to avoid, avoid both evils. And in order to do that, you have to limit the degree to which you modify the software so that it is not misrepresentation for it to still have that same name. It would, consumers would still be able to get the same expectation that they had from other versions of it. But that means what you've done is you've put some very serious impairments on how much you can modify that software in order for it to not be a misrepresentation by keeping the name on. So in my world, that's not free software. So that's my, that's my thesis. Um, final thought, I added this after I had lunch yesterday and I had um, lunch with Matteo and some other people and I don't know what on earth happened there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, and, his, and his point was, because he, he had the same, he'd run across this too, and he said we need to fix the problem that they're trying to solve. The problem is how do companies get credit for you know, basically running, you know, say they're running a shopping cart website as not, uh, as not commerce does. They want that credit. They want that. Um, and, and how do we go about solving that problem for them that's in a way that's not as offensive to me as this one? Are you taking questions? Uh, yes, because I'm done, so. So just based on that last comment, um, I mean, one of the reasons why s some of us are concerned about these bad rural licenses is that they were perceived as being kind of um, uh, sneaky attempts to discourage commercial licensees from engaging in modification. So um, if you have to put this big, gigantic logo powered by Sugar CRM on your, on your fork of Sugar CRM, you're going to be sort of disinclined, if you, at least if you're a commercial enterprise, from doing that. So this is so, sort of seen as a sneaky attempt to, to um, take away one of the rights that you're supposed to have with free software. So there may be a legitimate element to it as well, I suppose, like a desire for attribution in a kind of, yeah. you know, a kind of benevolent sense. But I think the c part of the concern is that this isn't really motivated by, it isn't something being done in good faith. It's really a, a, tr a sneaky thing to, to, um, to discourage modification. So can you just elaborate a little more on why it discourages modification? Why wouldn't I just take the, the well, because no matter what I do, so I want to I want to fork Sugar CRM and I want to make it like better than Sugar CRM. Mm -hmm. But I've have, if I have to put power by Sugar CRM uh, on everything, it's first of all it's sort of inaccurate in a sense because uh, right. it's not That's really it's not yeah. power by Sugar CRM. Right. Second of all, it's like that's now my competitor, and I have to credit my competitor when I'm trying to build a business. Um, you know, uh, taking away to your ability to brand your version of yeah, yeah 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 right yeah yeah so that, that was that's like part of the so concern then. The question, the first question is, before that question, is the question is, what is the problem they are trying to solve? Because yeah. if the if it turns out the problem they're trying to solve is, I would like to discourage competition, then in fact this is not the next question. The yeah, next question is, how do we tell them to jump in the lake? Yeah, this was a disturbing element. When, when this these licenses first appeared in 2006, 2007, it was very disturbing because many people had the sense that they were justifying it with this you know, benign justification that we want, we want credit yeah. when the actual motive was probably something very different. So I mean I have talked to developers where, mo where their, their motive is you know, what they see as attribution but they put that on a trademark instead of a name. I guess, um, uh, what was I going to say, the inability to brand, I, I, I mean I guess in a perfect open source world um, I, why do you care whether your name is associated? So you take their software, you hack it, you fix it, you pretty it up, you still have to have their label label on it. Why is 
what what harm does that cause you? You've lost goodwill, right? Because you can't. Isn't it the same kind of like loss of attribution problem that you're not getting credit for having done the the you know the good coding that fixed it? Kind of. I mean, I think that's an, maybe an attribution. I, I, I but, but visual logos are. I mean, individual developers aren't going to have individual logos, right? Yeah. I mean, they might a community project. Well, so yeah, community projects do very small projects. But what, I don't I don't know of any community project that's that's had a license that's made use of it's always commercial entities that make use of it. It's never a project saying, Hey, we're a community project, we'll use GPLv three and we'll take advantage of this this um, attribution requirement. We'll say anyone can use our code and modify it, but they have to preserve, you know, powered by community like Civi C R M, you know, you know, th th preserve our community logo. No I've never seen any example of that. It's always commercial entities. Yeah. Well, I think, um, so I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I, uh, what I found um, sort of a struggle about it was, I, I, what I felt the struggle was is anybody trying to find a way to define these licenses as problematic under open source or free software guidelines. Like that's, that's why it's happening, but it isn't necessarily a violation of the guidelines as far as I could, as far as I could read it. Yeah. Place our mark with their mark, and then go into industry selling our work at zero dollars. All the money we spent would be lost because somebody else would be a more effective marketer or salespeople because they won't have to spend the technical money. They will spend their money on marketing and sales that we don't have because we're spending all of that to build the software. And that's the fear that seems to be yeah. Y yeah, I, 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 saw, I, I thought I saw someone who wanted to retort that. <laughs> Did you want to retort that, or you just? I mean, my retort to that would be, what, why are you? Why do you have open source? Yeah, why? Yeah, why? Why? Why you have open source software? Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's. I think that's kind of Richard's point is, and what I one of the reasons I really like working in trademarks and open source is it really is a lot of people try to use it as a backdoor way to get back, just like the NOP. The NOP, you know, copyright infringement is illegal. You know, you know it's just it's um, to try to backdoor away to grab back what they granted away in the copyright licenses. Yeah. Well, the fear, I think, it should be more that people will take our code and introduce bugs and release it, and it would be powered by us. I thought that too, but it wasn't. It was very much someone's going to going to be a competitor for us overnight at a zero cost. Well, and, and this is and this is what Stefano was, was saying earlier was it's very hard to convince people that something bad will happen with it that you won't want to be associated with. But that's what you have to. That's the argument you have to make. But when you talk to these companies, like they don't, they're not. And the other, I've talked to someone about this, and they said, well, you know, kind of our stuff is so baked that we don't, we don't, we're not worried about bugs. So I would go back to a statement that Bradley made in his presentation earlier where he talked about companies co-opting environmental movements so they could say they're green, but they're really yeah. not. That's probably the reason these companies have chosen an open source license when they really don't want to give their software right. away. They can say, we're open source. Look how cool we are. We're open source. No, we're actually not really open source. Yeah, yeah. So. Sure. Um. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> um. No, come back to me. <laughs> I think you're the only one. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. I think, I think to your point, it's important to not assume malice when incompetence will serve us as well. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of these cases where a well meaning lawyer who has no comprehension of open source is right. sold by a product manager. Oh, yeah. That's where it's received. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, um, oh, I'm sorry. That's what the signal was before. Yeah. Um, so the comment was that, uh, uh, oh, gosh, you got to state the. Never, never assume malice. Yeah, never assume malice when incompetence will serve just as well. And it was maybe a me well-meaning lawyer who, um, you know, their client came to them and said, gee, we really want to do this. And I do, and I, I, it is a very difficult argument to make with someone, as Stefano would say, that, you know, it's very difficult to make that argument to say, you know, actually, you really don't want your trademark on it all the time. It's really not in your best interest. It's very hard to convince them of that. Yes. Yeah. You can be traced back to things like the 
Zimbra. Yeah, yeah, that's that, and that's yeah. The, as uh, the point was that there's cargo culting on the language. Absolutely, that's the case. Yeah, three of them they're similar. And again, in case we missed, in case I wasn't clear on the point, I don't think I don't think the GPLv3 is a problem. It said legal notices, author attributions, and additional legal notices or something. But it very it never said it never used the word trademark, never used the word logo, never gave implicit permission. It never gives express permission in that license itself. To trademarks that, that that requirement can be um, for trademarks or logos, it, people backdoor it claiming that it's an attribution when it's not really my argument. I think being just as a matter of like, like drafting history, the sugar syrup power by sugar CRM was the specific case that that they wanted to allow. For, you know, for yeah. Or worse. But for, to Bradley's point, that's not the way the language actually came out in the license. It's, it's not. That's right. It's yeah. Not, it's not yeah. Right. So, um, I, I thought of what it is, but the, the reason that cargo culting is happens is because this got approved before if we just use the same thing they can't find any reason to turn it down I suspect yeah but the, my, my question was more going to be is the problem of someone taking your code and basically flogging it as if it were their own specific it seems to me there's a particular class of software often like server software yeah for the web which particularly wants to use these licenses now is it the case that the business models that surround that type of software are particularly prone to this issue? And if not, what happens in other circumstances? Like, do people take RHEL and scrub all the logos off and sell support services for it? I mean, other people out there making businesses supporting CentOS. If there are, then, you know, RHEL is still a billion dollar company. Is it just because they're known to have all the expertise? <coughs> um, I mean, you know, how do, we, how do we argue with people and say, look, this isn't a problem in other areas of software. Why should it be a problem for you? Ah, uh, it's a good question. I'll try to answer it. It's, it's, it's weird to point out RHEL because RHEL being a very well established product, a very well established company, so that if you know Red Hat all the support went away to some other competitor, Red Hat would be able to get by for, for a while before going under completely. Not that I'm saying that Red Hat would go under completely for their stream purposes and all of that. But uh, in these cases, you look at Sugar CRM, you look at these other small things, you look at Zimbra Free, the uh, buyout, they're reasonably small startup companies. All of these companies are startups. They're not financially solvent. And so they have uh, arguably fears that uh, a strong competitor picking up their code and stripping the logos off of it and selling source in a way, somebody who's better established than they are could put them out of business. And so there's a fear that, you know, we're taking all these risks already by going with this open source software, that this sort of action can be seen as a mitigation of risk for them. And arguably, you know, you can rebut that by saying, well, you need to understand what and means to be involved in open source and how you profit and how that risk gets handled. But a lot of these companies, it's the first time they've been involved with open source right. in a real way, so they don't have that yeah, so just to summarize for purposes of video, Jerv's point was, you know, this this appears to be in a certain segment of the market, which is sort of, um, it's really, I think, um, what did you, what, what was, how, what, what did you characterize the market as, as this sort of service? Web service, web software, web service. Web, web services, server side web applications. Yeah, server side, yeah, server side web applications, and how do we convince them? It is Rel, is Red Hat's Enterprise Linux an example of why it's okay? Uh, and I think um, uh, so. Spot's point was these are really just startup companies, kind of naive about it. Not, I mean, honestly, we've all got, to, we all know that this is a huge leap of faith on the copyright side. It's a huge leap of faith to say, I'm going to give up this proprietary control, but the world's going to be okay because of it, and I'm going to be better because of it. Um, we've all made that leap of faith. I think that it just, on the trademark side, it, it still hasn't happened yet, or there's still as much resistance on that side as there is, you know, as there is on the copyright side. It just really is believing that, you know, you can let go of control and still be successful. Yes. So I, I, I want to comment on the earlier thing where, where you were talking about these people who have added these additional terms. Mm -hmm. And um, one, of the, one of the things that I know was designed in the GPL V3, uh, I'll be less involved in GPL V3 than you think, but I know this part, which was they had, uh, RMS really wanted to add that section where it says if someone puts an additional restriction that contradicts the terms of GPL, mm. downstream has the right to throw it away. Right. Yes. And, and, and the idea that RMS had was, well, the community will be self-policing because people will throw away these things that are actually not compatible with GPL because I guess he figured people might try to yeah. do this with the, oh, it's just one of these additional terms. The problem, is, the problem that I think was not anticipated that I see happening is there's a real bullying effect 
in that they, they, they frighten people, frighten users into thinking they, that it really is an addition, it's really permitted by GPL and they misquote the FSF and all this sort of thing. And I think it's been very challenging for the FSF to deal with the, the bullying behavior they didn't really expect yeah. by these people who are adding them. And so, so it, it kind of is a, is a flaw and a problem that I don't know how to fix. Yeah, I, just, I can give you even, it's not just like, um, you know, bullying of, of, of individual developers or the FSF. Um, Red Hat the customers. Red Hat looked at this, um, you know, because I knew that there was that provision in GPLv3 that you can remove unauthorized additional restrictions. And, you know, it's like, do you want to really take the risk uh, that your interpretation of GPLv3 is correct? It, it's, you know, it's easier to keep it in. And in one case, what we did was we kept it in and we had a notice saying, we think this is illegitimate, but we're keeping it in anyway just for informational purposes. And not to pre-announce, but I floated the idea with FSF, the general discussion, mm -hmm. that maybe FSF should start publishing thrown away ver like versions where we, where FSF determines yeah. that's not valid. We'll, we'll take the hit of the well, risk, and then you can be downstream from FSF. So the, pro yeah, but the, I, problem, the problem the problem, I, the problem I have, the problem I have is this language about attribution, about author attribution that was misinterpreted. That was my point about the, misin about the, about the misinterpretation and analogizing right, yeah, yeah. that to a trademark. So that you have specific language in there that says, oh, and by the way, we don't consider these to be problematic additional restrictions, one of them being author attribution. Oh, this powered by is equivalent to author attribution. Yeah. That's the part that I want to break to say, oh, it's not. No, it's I very agree different. with you. And I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm not what I said. I would love to do some pro bono work for FSF to help us draft <laughs> hey, something. Hey, if that you want me to go after these guys, I'll go. <laughs> 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 yeah, the thing is, that those, like Sugar CRM, after the FSF stopped looking at them, Sugar CRM went further and further, yeah. and they went well beyond what the license authorizes for. Yeah. Uh, for um, the legal notices for failure. Yeah. So they had, you know, you were required to put the logo in every every user interface screen. That's not in the license. That was not the intention of the yeah. license. And you know, Brett Smith could testify. To that. Well, and actually, if you notice on the Knob Commerce, it was that was just text. There was no logo on there. That was just text yeah. powered and by. They, and maybe that was they the picked text to try and avoid right. some exactly closer to illegal knowledge. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They very deliberately made it text instead of a logo mm -hmm. to avoid and to avoid these earlier arguments about what if we don't have a GUI? What if we, you know. To, to sort of solve those problems that had already been called out as being non-free. Uh, did you have a oh, question? I was just going to say that because I'm cynical, I'm going to bring the malice thing back in. Uh, in Zimbra's case, I would fully expect that the time that they were doing that was when there were, um, let's say, at least billions of dollars in VC money in Silicon Valley for any company that was in any way associated with open source. So they had VCs coming and giving them money saying, oh, cool, you're open source. Wait, how are we going to make money with this? Ha, let's do this. Let's do this magic thing in our license that will make us lots of money. And that, thankfully, has kind of evaporated. Just, oh, how do we fix this, right? Have either the FSF or the OSI ever un- blessed licenses? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a really, I, I was going to point out the difficulty so of that. I proposed it for the OSI. Uh, this is before I became an OSI a board member. Um, and actually, so, you know, I may propose it again, but but it wasn't really well received. I, I think there was a lot of reluctance to admit that a mistake was made in the past. Oh, so the, the reluctance is not due to the fallout. The reluctance is just due to the principle of admitting that you screwed something up? Yeah, exactly. Not, not on FSF's side. <laughs> not I mean, not FSF, FSF, FSF feels like it's created precedent, right? I mean, that's it's, it's like the, FSF views itself as the Supreme Court of software freedom, right? I, for better or worse. And it would be like overturning a Supreme Court decision, which you have to do sometimes, but there is a lot of fallout when that happens, and you, you, you're, you do it conservatively. Maybe you just need to do it like once for five licenses and never again. If there's like <laughs> your five kind of oops licenses. Yeah. And, there, and there was, <laughs> I mean, I mean Fontana hinted at it, and he knows the story. There, there was an error once upon a time, long, long ago, uh, and FSF reversed the decision. But nobody After probably, how long? Um, after a really long time. Really? Yeah. But how, how popular history. was the license? It's ancient history, and it was popular. I'll tell you. I'll tell you privately. <laughs> I know it's being recorded. <laughs> okay. Oh wait. Oh, okay. I, I thought you were raising your hand. Yeah. So given that there is precedent in both the FSF and the OSI for revoking license, albeit rarely. Uh, there isn't an OSI precedent, Rich was saying. Actually, there is. Uh, is there? One, but, uh, okay. It's not. It wasn't revoked. It wasn't it was revoked. Before. It wasn't revoked. Yes. It was retired, and we shall not speak to it again. <laughs> well, well, what is anybody using the common public attribution license? Oh, I, I, um, the uh, the the Reddit, code Reddit? Yeah, Reddit liberated their code under that license. 
Okay. But uh, the other point is that some of the GPL concerns seem to be arising around the term being misunderstood, and one obvious way in licenses to resolve this is to define that term, even if it already has an existing law dictionary definition, to reiterate that in the license text to try and minimize that. I know that uh, some of the licenses, like Apache and Mozilla, have explicitly taken that approach of going through and defining clearly these sorts of terms in the license itself. Sort of what you're done to to say, this is what this means. And okay. possibly you go so far as to say, this is what it doesn't mean. So I, I think, um, to me, the GPL v3 with the additional terms is the most problematic, but that has the best language to deal with it because, because you know, Sugar CRM, if they're off of that license at this point, you can just, anytime someone pops up like this, you can say, whoa, that's not, that's not an acceptable additional, additional term. The, 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 these, um, the Zimber license, the ones that have been approved, I think those are more challenging because those are kind of specifically blessed, whereas this other additional term stuff is in a gray area that gives you some latitude to say, no, it's, that's actually not what we meant <laughs> when we said that. When it's a GPL violation upon itself, really. So. But if they're writing yeah. in the gray area of the term, definition of the term legal notice, then by defining the term legal notice, uh, let me. I think they're just exploiting a misunderstanding. I don't think there's. A, does, does anyone here think that a, that that was a legal notice powered by not by Nop Commerce? Does anybody think that's a legal notice? Well, again, the, uh, a, a human who doesn't read legalese might not understand True. what a legal notice is. It may be where a PM says, "Hey, that's a legal notice." I, I see it on the yeah. websites. Yeah. That that whole. I mean, that whole Nop Commerce, you know, copyright removal tool was sort of laughable in its naivete. So yeah, I, I take your point that. I think this is probably one of those cases where they're taking advantage of the naivete of the customer. Oh, good point. Who knows where the naivete is? Their the owner, their never yeah. Really even really understand any of that, and certainly wouldn't be able to spend enough money to try to get them to do anything about it. Well, and I googled, I googled it, and and apparently people do pay for the copyright <laughs> removal notice, and you know. Yeah, right. And that's the point is that you hinted a lot at it, but didn't really say it. Their goal is for you to never use the open source version. And you, you were hinting at that all yeah. along, but that's yeah. that's the fact of the matter is they don't, they don't actually ever want the open source so called open source version used by anybody <coughs> anywhere. They want people to be caught using it, doing the wrong thing. Or just be like, I don't want to deal with this. So how much does it cost again? And they sell well, I'm not even. I don't even know. I, maybe it's bad for me to not know more about them. I don't know whether they have a crippled, if their open source version is crippled, or you know what's going on with it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know anything about them. Do you know how much that costs? The, do I know how much it costs? No, I didn't look that far. Because there might be a good business model in uh, in selling legal opinions. That <laughs> like, <laughs> legal opinions, why you can take off the power by the way. Wait, I'm trying to get this to do it for pro bono, and here you're telling her she can go make money. All right, I'll undersell, I'll undersell the copyright <laughs> removal notice by offering legal opinions on why you don't need the copyright removal yeah, notice. Key. Opinion, <laughs> and actually, any, any other any other questions? Sure All right, I think we're out of time. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.